Great. Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. My name is Jamie Bleck. I'm an associate professor of political science here at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm very excited to welcome you all to this discussion, uh, which is entitled Africa and the Return of Military Coups. Uh, I'm personally very invested and excited to hear the conversation today as the country that I love and study, Mali, has been severely affected by military coups, three since 2012. Um, so I'm really excited about a discussion that I think is going to uh, both complicate and hopefully offer some ideas and solutions for ways forward, we'll see, um, but also put the current sort of uh, situation in West and Central Africa in conversation with some historical cases potentially and with audience participation, maybe uh, also some cross-regional thinking. So that'd be great. So before um, jumping into the panel, I want to introduce our esteemed guests. First, we have Nanahal Singh, who's an associate professor at the Naval War College. He's a leading expert on coups. His 2014 book, if any of you have not read it, is really excellent. It's called Seizing Power, The Strategic Logic of Military Coups. It's based on over 300 hours of interviews um, with different figures, so highly recommended. Um, he has continued to work on coups. Uh, recent article, Don't Play Blame Contagion for the Resurgence of Coups. So maybe we'll see that, that argument today. Nanahal, I think you mentioned that you have a disclaimer. I do. Um, I'm speaking for myself, not for my institution or the US government. I also want to give a shout out to the Kellogg Institute for having funded hundreds of hours. I used like five years of undergraduate research assistance to gather the data for that book. And anytime I needed help, Kellogg in uh, Institute said, sure, we'd be happy to fund more research assistance for you. So a uh, big appreciation to the Kellogg Institute. Thank you, Kellogg. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Next, we have Rachel Riedel, who is also who is a Kellogg Fellow at one point. Um, but is currently the John S. Knight Professor in the Department of Government, as well as the Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell. Starting in July, she is going to be the Director for the Center on Global Democracy at Cornell. Um, she's also a co-host of Ufahamu Africa, along with Kimi Dion. Um, so uh, Rachel's an expert on comparative democratization, political party systems. Uh, has two fantastic books, one on sort of religious sermons and political participation in Africa, and another on authoritarian origins of democratic party systems in Africa. So please join me in welcoming Rachel. <laughs> Finally, we're really happy to welcome uh, Joseph Asunka back to Notre Dame for the second time. <laughs> he is the CEO of the Afrobarometer um, project, which many of you in the room are familiar with and reliant on. It's an incredible enterprise. He's been CEO there since 2021. Previously, he worked at the William and Flora Hewler Foundation on, in the Global Development and Population Program. Uh, he's published in a, a journal such as the, the British Journal of Political Science, as well as Population Research and Policy Review. He has a PhD in political science from UCLA. Uh, a big round of applause for Joseph. Okay, so just in way of background, um, there have been nine military coups in Africa since 2020. So if we count some of the countries, Mali, Gabon, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Chad, and Niger. Um, and so in this panel, I hope that we can make sense of this coup wave, uh, place these coups in a broader uh, trajectory of governance. Um, and really, I'd encourage the panelists, if we can, I think to think about some of the broader conversations and themes that have come up over the course of the last two and a half days. So just thinking about the case I know best, Mali, um, some of the earlier panels, the references to uh, concerns about security, um, issues related to sovereignty and former colonial powers, um, accountability and the government's ability to respond to citizens' needs, isolated political class who might be buffered from some of what the what citizens are feeling. Those are some of the, the themes that I think uh, at least are very relevant for the Malian case, but any time that we can pull in, I think, the previous discussions, I think that would be very helpful. So, in way of starting, uh, the panel presents a coup wave, uh, so I think one of the most important first things to do is perhaps 
to disaggregate what we mean by coups, because as will soon be discussed, these are very different coups in many ways. Um, but I also want to try to identify some of the, tr the trends. So I'll pull out uh, for the larger group. I'm going to throw out questions, and then we'll leave it to sort of the first responder here. The first question for the panel is, in what ways are these coups and their relationships to broader governance trajectories similar? And in what ways are these coups very different? Um, I'm going to give a, an unpopular answer to that which is, it looks, when you're, when you're viewing this from the outside, it feels like we once used to have a lot of coups and then the number of coups in the world died down and now all of a sudden they're back. And the reasons why it feels that way, uh, the head of the UN said this, the head of ECOWAS said this, a lot of political leaders are concerned about the return of coups. I actually think that the current wave of coups is very similar in a number of ways to what used to happen before. Um, and what's more, I think that they are much more different from each other than it looks, which is to say we're looking at a whole bunch of events which are happening and we are imposing a commonality on them and I don't think that they are all happening for the same new reason. That is to say, I think they're happening for the same old reason and why is it that coups used to happen? C countries with past coups have more coups. That was true about almost all of these, except for Gabon. Countries that are anocratic, that is, which are neither democratic nor authoritarian, which is true for almost all of these, and countries which are poor. These are all countries which have a persistent problem with coups. And we were lucky that for a period of time, we had fewer coups, but now, the individual countries are having coups for very different reasons, right? In one case, uh, the head of the presidential guard was going to get fired, and so he moved to overthrow the government. In another case, you had a transition towards civilian rule, and the military wanted to block that. So you've got very different stories going on. So I think that the domestic stories are individually different, but they're not different from what used to happen before. That said, and I'm gonna put a bookmark here for later, I think the international context has changed a good deal. And I think that may be part of the story which explains this clumping. Great, so just to follow up on that, I want to agree that there are ways in which the, there are kinds of persistent problems that the coups are a response to, and I would put these as three. The first is, and, and I agree with Nana Hall's point that there are different kind of specific catalysts or specific reasons why a coup takes place at a specific moment, but I think there are three kind of main underlying currents that help us to understand. And the first is really about protracted political dysfunction and the insufficiency of electoralism. And so this kind of comes back to neither democratic nor authoritarian. Um, it's that in-between space of competitive authoritarianism. Elections are happening. That's insufficient, as we heard in the uh, panel before with uh, Helena's remarks. Um, Democracy is not vibrantly democratic in terms of participation and meeting the needs of the population in many cases, right? And so this comes back to one of the points that Jamie made as well around kind of insulated elites, disconnected from the population, um, to, to Wendy's point and, uh, uh, and, and Evelyn's point about um, parties not necessarily being this link to society that have to help to channel the needs of diverse populations into governance that meets those needs. And so we see um, that coups are a response in some parts of, of the, uh, some of these countries of a way to get to better democratic governance outcomes, better functioning democracies. And in, in, in some cases, um, the coups were a response to not respecting term limits, such as Omar Bongo in Gabon and Alpha Conde in, in Guinea or the kind of autocratization of civilian governments. So the insufficient democratic conduct of electoral politics. The second really responds to what we heard from this morning's panel around regional insecurity, the inability to broadcast power over the territory, the inability to take on um, 
extremist non-state actors who are wreaking havoc on civilian populations. So um, as Scott Mainwaring was saying this morning, uh, the Bukele scenario, right? Public security is so terrible in some regions, in some instances, that citizens are willing to trade off for an authoritarian leader, a military takeover, in order to try to gain public security. And so these are, are real responses to deep um, threats that have then been compounded by massive state-led violation of rights. So for example, um, in Burkina Faso, an interesting kind of early coup in 1987 brought Blaise Compori to power. So this is back to Nana Hall's point about past coups. Kampore reigned for 27 years, went through the authoritarian period, then into the competitive authoritarian period, won many elections, and then um, was attempting to change the constitution to end term limits in 2014 to stay in power, right? To be able to maintain that competitive authoritarianism. This led to massive strikes, protests, real desire by the population to no longer have Kampore in power, ready, ready for those term limits to take hold. Um, and that set of protests and civil mobilization led to a military interim government to get to democratic elections. Now, under um, the then um, opposition uh, president that was elected, Kobore, he was elected as this alternative to competitive authoritarianism, but the security situation in Burkina continued to, dis to uh, get worse, to, um, to um, disintegrate, and so the state, the citizens witnessed the displacement of more than a million people as armed groups that were linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State attacked villages in the country, but so too the state response often worsened the security situation. State security forces routinely, uh, and pro-government militias, routinely commit extrajudicial killings during counter-terrorism operations. So the security situation is very much a kind of global cross-regional um, question of how much order do you need to be able to provide liberty? How does security provide a foundation for democratic rights and democratic governance? The third uh, factor which is tied in is really an anti-North, anti-Western um, sense of interventionism, an ongoing interventionism of both of how democracy in its Western concept is mapped on insufficiently to, to local needs, and so too how the global fight on terror is mapped on insufficiently to local security challenges. Both of those lenses have led to uh, France being ejected from Francophone West Africa, from the US being kicked out of its military base in Niger. The way in which the kind of interventionism is fueling uh, these kinds of support for coups or the ways in which military actors are freed from uh, those, those uh, external constraints potentially um, as an important element of a cross-regional story as well. All right. Um, thank you. And thank you so much, Kellogg, for bringing me back. Um, now that I know that you can pay for research assistance, I would have to come, <laughs> come, to, come to you for some support on that. Um, well, I don't think there's much to add to what my you know, able colleagues have said. I, I totally agree with them. Some of the underlying factors, especially the historical factors, talking about the experience of past coups, is certainly a key driver. One historical you know, fact I would add to that is the, the third wave of democratization, the transition to democratic rule. So countries that did not really successfully transition properly are also very susceptible to, to coups, and we see that happening across the countries that have been affected to date. And I can't emphasize enough about the democratic deficits, which kind of creates this opportunity for the military to step in. For all the surveys that we've done across the continent in about 40 plus countries asking about term limits, I've always said that the only indicator in the Afrobarometer that has consistently since 1999 been a majority view is support for presidential term limits. Even in countries where it is the lowest, it's still about 53%. Countries like Gabon that doesn't even have term limits in their constitution, over 90% of Gabonese want term limits. And so it is not surprising that often when you see presidents try to change term limits, it provokes a public uproar. Of course, Macky Saltro was trying it in Senegal and he saw the consequences and had to backtrack. 
he backtracked of course I, I do know um, James Long talked about the judiciary which I'll, I'll get back to later on in this conversation but I do think that some of these democratic deficits and their data do show that the democratic deficits are really hurting so much of Africans confidence in democratic governance they haven't given up yet and I'll talk about more about that later but it is just a case that it creates an opportunity for the military to step in, exploit some of those frustrations. So it's, I think one of the underlying commonality is just citizen frustration with the delivery of democracy. Delivery in the sense of democratic governance, not just the economic goods, but clean elections, term respect for term limits, rule of law and the like, these are the critical things that actually drive Africans' commitment to democracy. Sometimes people would argue it is economic factors, but no, our data don't show that. It is when elections are not clean, when there's no lack of rule of law, and all the core democratic norms and institutions which Africans stand for, when those are violated, that's where the gap comes in, and the military can exploit that, and they know to, because they live in the system. Thank you, Joseph. So uh, both Joseph and Rachel touched on this idea of a democratic deficit. Um, Rachel, you were talking about the insufficiency of electoralism, which certainly for me rings true in terms of when I hear um, some of my Malian colleagues talk about a real uh, spotlighting of elections, but without sufficient attention to some of the other things that Joseph was, was mentioning right now. And so uh, you all anticipated my, my next question a bit, so I have to reformulate, but I, I guess I'll do it this way in asking the three of you so particularly in the set of countries that were somewhat experienced with multi-party rule, had experienced at least one or two uh, executive transitions, why, why do you think currently there's been a turn towards the military as a solution to this deficit? All right, maybe I'll, I'll just start with, from the data side and then my academics who can talk about all the, 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 the theories and you know, the other aspects that they have learned. But from the data point of view, um, I mean, one key thing being the democratic deficit, that people see these gaps and they, they, are, they, are concerned, um, they, they express concerns about it. But I think over time, in the data that we've seen, we've been asking Africans, what is the most important policy issue that you want your government to address? And it has always, almost always in every country, is unemployment, health, education for many, many years until the last decade. And then we saw crime and security becoming a big concern. And so crime and insecurity started rising in Burkina Faso, it started rising in Mali and in Nigeria. And coupled with that, the military tends to be the most trusted democratic institution on the continent. It has been like that over time. I mean, the military is on top, followed by traditional leaders as well as um, religious leaders before the democratic, I mean, the key uh, democratic arms of government, so the judiciary and the presidency and the like, they fall way, way below there. And so if you have a combination of where people are concerned about crime and insecurity and the military is trusted, it creates this blend where when people are then frustrated about the inability of their government or their leaders to deliver democracy, and I would always add this, it is not the fault of democracy. It is the inability of leaders to deliver that creates this problem. And it's not the case that Africans don't want democracy. They are solidly committed and supportive of democracy. Their leaders are failing, they trust the military, and if there's an issue of crime and insecurity concerns about that, then that's when it creates an opportunity for the military to step in because of the sense that the military may be able to do better when it comes to security, insecurity or security. Unfortunately, they are not. I mean, the facts do bear it out, but when you think about it, it just seems like they will be the best people to deal with this situation. So when citizens are very frustrated about their security situation and they trust the military, one can only expect that they would exploit that and then we see these schools happening. Absolutely, I, I totally agree. If you look at Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Niger, and Sudan, all of the militaries justified, you know, what is the rationale that they give? It was on uh, security grounds, right? Gabon and Guinea justified um, their, their power grab on the grounds of incumbents uh, abolishing term limits. So here we have very clearly, you know, tied to these two issues. 
One of the interesting things, Jamie, that I think your question elicits is, you know, these are, we're looking at countries that have been, have been having electoral competition. And so what are some of the ways in which citizens are turning to military solutions, often in looking to other solutions first, and then whether or not those other solutions are able to deliver. So we see, for example, uh, again, kind of paralleling the morning panel conversation, in Nigeria, the way to deal with, in part, a response to the security situation, Boko Haram in particular, was to elect the military general, Buhari. Right? And so this is another way of not having the military coup, but bringing in the trusted generals and uh, experienced military officers as elected um, uh, uh, leaders. And so again, this is a, a kind of overlapping strategy uh, that we see both in, in Africa and in Latin America. And also turning to the courts. So as James Long was saying this morning, you know, an ability to look to the other institutions as you know, horizontal accountability measures. We see that where the courts have stood up for democracy, we've been able to avoid this coup route. So we've had courts being very, very significant actors in terms of democratic governance, underlying uh, more than electoralism in uh, Malawi, in Kenya, recently in Senegal, um, and also in South Africa with the new ruling uh, against Jacob Zuma. So really interesting, important roles of courts as alternative actors uh, potentially gaining that trust of the population in certain circumstances. And I will add, in most cases, in, in Malawi in particular, as our, my colleague Kim Yindian has has shown, the courts were emboldened to act as democratic actors because of mobilization from below, because of uh, civil society protest demanding democratic governance around, uh, you know, not uh, problematic elections. I would situate the the point of leverage at a slightly different place, which is to say, in the moment of a coup, militaries are largely looking inwards and demand what, how legitimate a coup is seen, how legitimate a junta is. These things aren't going to matter in that very brief period of time. But as soon as it's over, what happens next is a return to normal politics. And that's where you look at legitimation strategies how do you justify what you're doing? Do you create a junta even as a, as a transitional institution? Or do you immediately hand over power to a civilian vice president? Um, if you create a junta, what does it look like? What, what does a transitional government look like? Is, is it a junta or is it some sort of mixed institution? Does it stay long? What trajectory does it take? All of these factors here show up immediately as soon as the coup ends. And so to Jamie's question, the failure of democratic governments to provide goods, whether to provide legitimate democracy, to provide security, to provide, um, in, in the past, jobs, all of these things kick back in the minute the military has, has taken over and the dust is, is settling. And that's a, that's a, a, minor, a minor quibble um, but the point is that as soon as it's over, I, I think we're, we're in agreement about all of the, the challenges that we're going to face. Um, and we've, we've seen hugely disappointing performance from multi-party uh, regimes thus far. So Nanahala, actually, I want to follow up on an earlier point you made, and that was about the shifting geopolitical context mm -hmm. or the, the shifting inter international parameters of, of previous eras to, to today. And so could you speak a bit to that? So if you look at what happened with coups during the Cold War, coups were considered pretty legitimate. There's a point in the 80s where people start pushing democratic norms, and so coups become increasingly illegitimate. But the real change happens at the end of the Cold War. So by the 1990s, we're finally at a place where majority of coups are condemned by at least one Western government. But it takes until then. And there is a brief period of time between 2005 and 2009 where every single coup in the world is criticized by at least one Western government and one or one liberal multilateral institution. 
That is the only time at which that's true. It wasn't true before, and it's not true afterwards. And so this norm, which is built up, immediately starts to crumble. And, and in that period, it has a strong effect, particularly when it's associated with um, financial penalties and diplomatic penalties, exclusion from regional associations, loss of legitimacy, loss of access to funding, whether from wealthy countries or from multilateral association uh, institutions. And so all of these things help to create a norm against coups. And this norm against coups, I think, is one of the factors which reduces the total amount of coup making in the world. There are certain regions where coups become very rare. Latin America goes from a region with a lot of coups to almost no coups. Even in Africa, which is a region which had a ton of coups, you see fewer coups in, in, as a result of the post-Cold War um, understanding of things. And one of the things you see, which I, I thought was fascinating, is a shift in legitimation strategy. And so between the Cold War and the post-Cold War period, the, uh, the extent to which democratic values are invoked in defense of the coup goes up three times. And after the Cold War, you are twice, um, sorry, three times more likely to say that your military intervention is not really a coup. Twice as likely to invoke democratic values to say we're defending democracy. 45% more likely to say we're just here temporarily. And so when you see even military actors seizing power using norms of democracy to justify what they're doing, that tells you how strong this norm was. Um, so then, what happens? Well, a number of things happen. 9-11, the rise of the war on terror. Um, the US starts to be a lot more concerned with, uh, with security than with democracy. So when there's a coup in Egypt or later on in Algeria, these are not considered coups. They don't meet, get hit with sanctions. And this happens across the board. The U.S. pulls back in both its diplomatic and its economic sanctions, but the same thing happens with the United Nations, with the, world, with, uh, with the EU, and you see a crumbling of this norm. And I think there are a few different things which are happening here. One of them is a concern with security. Another is multipolarity, right? So you have China and Russia, and not just China and Russia, but in Africa you have um, the UAE, you have Turkey, and so even if you are shunned by the West, you have other options. So if you're Niger, you can kick out the French and you can kick out the Americans. You can bring in the Russians and you can sell uranium to the Iranians, and you can continue to, to persist. The Chinese have made it very clear that they aren't going to withhold support from countries um, where there's a coup, and they've been very consistent about this. It's surprisingly principled for an unprincipled stance. Even when they were very close with the previous regime that is overthrown, they do not penalize the replacement regime. They say, whoever is in charge, we will continue to get along with them. And so, as a result of these different factors, the U.S. and Western countries are no longer defending this norm. The norm is under attack, and we are seeing, I think, a resurgence in military juntas. So I, I think the, the pressure for coups was always there, but what was going to happen afterwards is now it's, it's safe to have a military government again and to flaunt, to, to, to completely disregard openly the pressure to, um, to try to democratize. And we see this very clearly with Mali. Can I add on to that? Please. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question, and I, I completely agree with Donna Hall. And one of the things that we see kind of coming out of the data um, on, you know, using variety of VDEM and et cetera, um, in a new paper by Steph Haggard and Christina Cotiero is the, the number of regional, on an international organizational level, the number of authoritarian governments within a regional uh, association dramatically shapes whether the kind of, 
regional association has more support for uh, a country that's autocratizing or uh, more sanction or pressure against them. And so this is a really interesting um, phenomenon when we think about organizations like the African Union, when we think about ECOWAS in particular. And now ECOWAS is an interesting um, case because we have uh, you know, sanctions that were applied against um, Niger, Burkina, and Mali, and as a, a subgroup of ECOWAS, those three countries are now pulling out of ECOWAS in protest against this kind of anti-military mm -hmm. coup um, kind of norm and sanctioning. Um, and so the ways in which the regional is reflected back onto the domestic, but those dynamics are changing with this global um, democratic backsliding um, uh, that we are experiencing in the multipolar world that Nana Hall is describing is, is quite significant. When we see um, cheer, cheering crowds in, in a, in, following a, a military intervention, they're often wa waving Russian flags. And those Russian flags are a kind of way of demonstrating, in many cases in, in these countries, an anti-French interventionist stance against a kind of sense of Western-led democracy promotion that's now conflated with a, a, a way of thinking about neocolonialism and um, the general subordination of local development needs to Western security objectives of the globalized war on terror, um, which erodes the authority and legitimacy of local elites and the ability to respond to, uh, to good governance um, kinds of demands from the population. So I think that those are very intertwined, the domestic pressures along with the regional and international landscape. I mean, just one point on this, and I couldn't agree more with them in terms of the, the overemphasis on security and especially fighting um, violent extremism or extremist groups in different parts of the continent. I think this has led many foreign, whether it's the US or other, um, France or others, putting their own security at the front of anything that happens in any country to the extent that you may end up propping up crop leaders because they are able to resist or fight some kinds of insurgency within a particular context. And what that does is, you know, it, there are two things. One, of course, it doesn't really put priority on the development needs of those countries. But secondly, it can create this challenge where the data that we have do show that Corruption is one of the factors that actually erodes people's confidence in democracy. As I said, it is not the economic variables that impact whether or not people are committed to democracy. But when corruption starts to grow, then people's commitment to democracy begins to, de uh, to decline. And I think one of the channels through which inadvertently some of the Western countries do to undermine democracy on the continent is to prop up corrupt leaders because they help to fight extremism and ignore the fact that these are corrupt actors who are in they're just directly then impacting the way their citizens are committed to democratic governance. Because corruption erodes their confidence in democracy. And so if you prop up a corrupt leader for that reason, it just goes to deepening our fears about democratic decline because this is, a critical piece, especially when it comes to corruption at the local government level, but even at uh, the central government level. But the data that we have do show that corruption at the local government level is the most corrosive factor when it comes to people's commitment to democracy. And so I think this is where the external five, you know, like, um, relations do damage democracy on the continent. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one thing to these points, which is this is where we see convergence between the damage to democracy caused by coups and the damage to democracy caused by other forms of democratic backsliding, mm -hmm. right? The fact that these coups are occurring in a context where you have increasing backsliding and you have corrupt governments that may have uh, overstayed their term limits or which may not have been properly elected, there was a fig leaf of an election, all of these things then create a much more permissive international environment and decrease legitimation at the grassroots so that when a military junta does come in, it's not viewed as hugely different from what had come before. Mm 
just to say that if we look at, so one of the um, ways in which, you know, corrupt leaders are propped up because they help to fight extremism. So too, uh, non-democratic leaders are often propped up because they're helping to fight migration into Europe. Mm -hmm. And when we look at that, uh, particularly in Tunisia, another form of coup, really, a self-coup, a presidential coup, right, where the uh, Tunisian president uh, disbanded the parliament and, and cut out uh, horizontal uh, accountability checks, um, very little, very muted response from the global community, in part because the Tunisian uh, state is a partner in limiting migration uh, from North Africa into Europe. And so this is another kind of key example of what Joseph was mentioning. And I just want to um, uh, kind of uh, update, so one of the things, or, or clarify one of the things that I said around um, Western-led democracy promotion. There is still huge demand, and I would be curious to see if, if Joseph sees this as well. I think there's still huge demand from democratic actors for, uh, for international support. That is not at all my claim, that that is, doesn't exist, right? There's huge demand for pro-democracy actors who are seeking uh, gov good governance, good democratic governance to ally with Western actors, to ally with Global South actors. Um, and so it's where the... Um, interventionist uh, types of policies are really externally informed and not partnering with local actors as we were discussing in early pa uh, pa earlier panels where that becomes uh, much more challenging to supporting democracy. Thank you all. So in the last panel, uh, Helena charged us with thinking through how everyday people are living through um, these forms of governance. So I wanna turn to, to the more grassroots level and try to get your assessment of how populations are reacting, um, maybe across different countries. Speaking in the case of Mali, which is a case where people were out on the streets, like sacrificing for democracy through protests in the 1990s, um, highly committed to freedom of expression, freedom of liberty. And yet, when we look at, I think, the most recent Afrobarometer poll, and Joseph can correct me if I'm wrong, support for democracy as the most preferable form of government has dropped from 75% support in 2014 to 39% uh, in 2022. And, and just to put this in conversation with the first coup in Mali in 2012, I believe um, Masa Koulibaly and Michael Bratton, when they released a paper about popular perceptions in that moment, I think there was still overwhelming, over 70, I want to say 80% support for democracy as the most preferable form of government. So something very interesting is going on here, right? Um, and, and this is being stated in a context where people are dealing with conditions such as extreme drought, um, food insecurity, and yet there's still this um, sort of belief in the junta's vision if the public opinion data is to be believed. Yeah, I mean, in terms of citizen response, I think much of it starts from where we started from the democratic def deficits and the, the yearnings of Africans for democratic governance. Um, when we started asking these questions, Mali was one of the first countries we surveyed in 1999. We've been surveying that country over time. I think one of the, the critical things we've observed is over time, you know, when we started asking about you know, preference for democracy. I mean, across the board, it was strong preference for democracy. What we are beginning to observe now is that, you know, a gradual decline in people's commitment to democratic governance. To, I mean, on average, across the 30 plus countries that we've surveyed, it's still a majority view. It's in a few countries like in Mali and in mm -hmm. South Africa where support for democracy has actually dropped. Mm -hmm. And this is why I was like, talking about the issue of corruption because in South Africa it's all about the issues of corruption. In the specific case of Mali, it's a combination of things. So one was just being the fact that the economic situation, that's people were protesting on the streets because the economic situation was really getting very bad and our data do show that poverty has increased a lot in that region but across the African continent and it was, it was interesting to see the data that was presented here in, on the Latin America case where you know you've seen poverty drop a little bit now the Africa rising narrative of the 2010, 2014 you could see poverty dropping in our data, but now poverty has gone up almost two or three fold since then. And so that's created the condition for people to push into the streets and start um, pushing for, for some kind of change in terms of their livelihood. But the critical driver in the case of um, 
Mali, it has been the government's inability, as we said at the beginning, to just meet the basic democratic needs of citizens. Thank you. And so on the African continent, we've seen this over time, where gradually we see people are less, dissatis and are less satisfied with the way democracy works. And when we ask people whether or not you think your country is a democracy, fewer and fewer people are feeling that they come to their countries are really democratic. And these are the things that kind of drive people to feel that the military could be an alternative. And that's an unfortunate turn of events because what we have observed is over time, when we ask people whether or not no, the military is even an option, okay, it used to be the case that more than 70% of Africans said military rule, no, no, not at all. The last five or 10 years, we've seen that resistance, the level to extent to which Africans rejected military rule has softened over time. And so it started like 75% in 2014, it's now down to about 65%. So it's still a majority view that now, majority still reject military rule, but the extent of rejection has softened over time. And the last round of the survey we did ask, if your, uh, your elected leaders abuse power, should the military step in? And that's when we saw a majority actually saying yes. About 53% of Africans saying, if elected leaders abuse power, the military should step in. And this view was actually more popular among young people between 18 and 35 years, <coughs> which is pretty concerning for us. And so, I mean, back to your specific question, I think when citizens the democratic needs are not met and the military step in, you will see them celebrating on the streets. The celebrations are more about the intervention than it is military rule. African citizens may want a change, and if the military steps in, sometimes they see that as the means to the change. And so support for military intervention may be high, but support for military rule is not. Africans don't want military rule, but they appreciate the, the intervention and often you see them celebrating on the streets. The question is how long will it take you to get back? As my colleague mentioned here, even the military themselves use democratic principles to justify why they are doing this. And it's always the case that we are here temporarily. How temporal that is? Actually in the current round, 10 surveys that we are conducting in about 42 countries, we've asked the question, how long should the military stay if they do take power? Because People think they should intervene, but now I want to know how long they should stay. And hopefully that will provide some kind of uh, data point for us as we engage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly, it's such a good point, Joseph. And I think, you know, when we look at a set of surrounding countries as kind of most similar um, case studies, uh, I think Senegal is a really instructive case for us to look at a neighbor to Mali, you know, in the region. And exactly to this point, I think, there is a clear rejection of abuse of power, of corruption, of overstaying term limits. The difference in Senegal, which has never had a military coup, right, is partly this past precedent mm -hmm. doesn't exist. It's partly because the desire for change, the real desire for a different type of candidate, an anti-establishment candidate, a newcomer, was able to be channeled through the courts and through elections. So um, the, the uh, Incumbent President Macky Sall was, you know, not giving clear signals about whether or not he was going to step down. Maybe he would try to run again, and you know, because he had changed the constitution, maybe he could have another another term, which was the exact same argument that he had made to win uh, against the prior president. So he knew well that the the population, you know, the voters were not going to respond well to that argument. Eventually, with some international. Uh, support, dip diplomatic support. He made the decision to be uh, the good president and, and step down. Um, and so the courts played a key role in forcing elections to be held. Um, and the selection of candidates played a key role in giving voters a choice. So they voted for a relatively unknown uh, candidate who um, is part of Osman Sanko's party, who was a tax uh, collector and, and um, had really gone after leading political elites in terms of uh, corruption, uh, was a whistleblower. And so choosing this kind of relative outsider um, is, a, is an indicator of a desire for change, but an ability to do so through the kinds of channels that uh, other, in other countries people are turning to the military as this intermediary kind of promissory 
uh, coup as a route to get to a democratic governance that will work for citizens. Great, thank you. So actually what I want to do now is open things up to the audience. I can see many people in here who are experts in different regions, different areas. I have more questions that I can ask, but I wanted to first give a chance to the audience to ask questions that they might have. So I'm hearing two themes that lead to coups. One of them is something Rachel seems to be emphasizing, which is that the countries who have stronger institutions seem to hold, seem to prevent coups from happening. That the countries that have just severe institutional weakness seem to fall prey to coups. The other thing that seems to be combined with that is when Western countries are giving significant support to militaries and building up their capacity at the same time. So I'd like to just kind of clarify whether or not I'm understanding this right, that it's a combination of institutional weakness with overcapacity within militaries that's leading to coups within these regions. I, I think you're, you're right that these are both part of the story, but one of the things is that and I should be careful here, I'm speaking only for myself. Um, when the US works with partner militaries to build up their capacity, oftentimes we do so in a vacuum. And we are trying to maintain stability and create capacity, tactical capacity, but this is done without addressing the other concerns that exist. And if a government is corrupt, if there's insecurity and this stronger military is still not able to be successful at reducing insecurity in this country, then what's happening is the institution, uh, the, the legitimacy of whoever's in power decreases over time. And these things are part of this anocratic story. If you are in Senegal, or you're in Argentina, you can weather big bumps in what's going on without the military wanting to be any part of it. And if they're invited to, to be part of it, they say, no, we, we don't want to be, we don't want to take power, thank you very much. But that's not true elsewhere. And so one of the, the ironies here is that because we have a hammer and everything looks like a nail, we end up pursuing paths which the, the US government ends up pursuing paths which create outcomes which are the opposite from what they intend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, a great segue to, I don't think that in general we can say there's an overcapacity of military uh, strength. And um, I think that to Nana Hall's point, it's being wielded in ways that don't map on to uh, local governance realities, but the, the real security crisis is a combination of kind of lack of military, police, and bureaucratic uh, state capacity to really govern across very difficult territories, which is also connected to the kind of rise of drug cartels that we were talking about in the Latin American uh, panel this morning. The ability to control trade routes that bring, that are trafficking routes from Latin America of drugs across the Trans-Saharan ancient trade routes, right, that are still being used for these purposes, west, east and, and north up to Europe, is very valuable commodity. And so there's not necessarily an overcapacity of military um, strength that is you know, related to this training, it's just the mismatch of uh, the need for being able to provide order security in a democratic, uh, rules-based uh, governance system. I also think relatedly, it's not only where you have institutional weakness that we see the rise of coups. There are many very weakly institutionalized uh, competitive authoritarian regimes um, in the region, 
uh, in Benin, you know, and we see uh, vibrant turnover in, in Zambia, uh, you know, which is an example of place where we, we are, are hopeful for democracy's future. So I don't map those on directly um, in terms of we're likely to see coups just where we have institutional weakness. But the inability, it's certainly the case that um, where you have the ability for institutions to channel the democratic demands, that we're more likely to be able to avoid this kind of military intervention as a solution um, to the uh, problem of, of political dysfunction. Yeah, and I think I totally agree with Rachel. It's, it's not about the military strength. It's not necessarily that the military needs a lot of capacity to overthrow uh, a sitting government. It's, it's, it's just minimal. Sometimes it's, it's a matter of getting the military security guard to arrest the president, which doesn't take much of a skill. But the institutional side, yes, what Rachel has said makes it perfectly right that you know, where there are institutions that can counter or provide the alternative for citizens to be able to continue to enjoy the democratic dividends, that is when you can see these things, um, at least coups being muted, okay, in that, in that sense. And I say this because when we look at the data of South, Af I mean, South Africa and Mali, if you look at the trends that happened in Mali that led to the coup, South Africa is almost maybe worse than that. If South Africa didn't have alternative institutions that could support the system, the military could have stepped in. In fact, our data would have predicted that that would have been the next country to go to have a military coup based on the indicators we have. And so in some cases, of course, right before the Gabonese coup, the indicators also pointed the same way. And I wrote in a piece of paper which was yet to be published, but before it was published, the coup happened. And so the prediction had to be taken out of of that paper at that, that point. But I just said this to, to indicate that where there are institutions that can create the opportunity, like it happened in Senegal, there's some leeway for institutions to make sure that citizens' interests or frustrations can be addressed. It's, it's very helpful. Yeah, I think Rachel or Joseph, I forget, made the point earlier about that when there's a failure of a horizontal check, I think the citizens, citizens searching for some other means to check what they feel is backsliding or non-accountable governance. And I'd say also like in trying to manage a tremendous uh, challenging security situation, what are the potential paths forward? Who might have an alternative vision? Who might have a broader sort of scope of policy solutions and thinking of potentially military actors as being able to be sort of an outside voice, a different framework when frustrated with sort of the status quo. Yeah, uh, Kunle, and then we'll go down the line. Um. Thank you. Um, Kunle Walabi, Villanova University. Um, I really appreciated the opening kind of comments um, differentiating between the countries that have had a long history of frequent coups, particularly in the 60s through 80s. So that's a lot of the West African countries and those like Gabon where um, you have not had a lot of coup activity in the past and it's kind of a response to like a long period of kind of personalist family dictatorship. Um, and instead of thinking about that moving f forward, um, I was wondering if you guys could comment a little bit about some of the variations across the countries that have experienced coups in the last little while, as far as like what the military actually does when they're in power. And I'm kind of thinking about this along two different dimensions. One is like whether whether it's kind of like a transitional government where this is made explicit from the beginning that this is about changing regime, right? And allowing for some other kind of political governance to, to, to move forward or whether this might be a longer term strategy that is more sharply geared toward like specific security concerns of the kind that might um, exist in a country like Mali or Burkina, right? So that's one um, question. A second related one that I have um, 
is about what these coups actually mean as far as how, um, how much of a change this actually is in terms of how democratic or not different countries are. I haven't looked at VDEM data on this, but like Freedom House is quite interesting because some of these countries that have experienced coups, I was just teaching a grad course on African politics this past semester, and so um, I remember pointing out to my students that we were gonna look at the Freedom House, the new scores when they came out this year to see whether there were observable changes um, in some of the countries that had experienced coups. And some countries like Niger um, and Gabon, basically nothing changed. And then other countries like Mali, like if you look at the Freedom House trend over 10 years, the changes are like day and night. So I guess what I'm asking, and I don't know the answer to this, is that um, how much of this is actually like a threat to the very kind of tricky mix of authoritarianism and democracy that actually exists in a lot of the majority probably of African countries on the ground that are like neither democratic nor authoritarian pre-coup and post-coup, how much change has there actually been as far as like democracy, like democratic governance in practice? Thank you. Great questions. All right, so yeah, let me take the, uh, start on the, the first question in terms of um, the military coming in and whether or not you know, this, this, this led, is going to be a permanent situation or may, may change somewhat. I, my hope is that it will change and the military, many of the military contests, I hope they know that. And I say this because, as I mentioned at the beginning, they, the military is not known for being good at delivering anything, good governance, economic performance, it's even security. As at this point in Mali and Burkina Faso, it's not as if the extremism has stopped. In some cases, it's actually gone up. And so the risk of the military staying in power for a long time is two. One, that their weaknesses in terms of governing are going to be exposed. So citizens will increasingly have less confidence in the military because of the experience of it. And their weaknesses, especially when it comes to providing security. If they fail in that side, and especially in Mali now, we know that they have almost woefully failed. The same thing is happening in Burkina Faso. So the longer they stay, the more likely it is that they are going to expose themselves in terms of what they are incapable of doing. But then what will that lead to? That might then lead to citizens starting to agitate for change because they want to see better governance just as they did when they came into power because their elect elected leaders did not deliver. The risk of the military is that they may now crack down on human rights and it can lead to a situation where the region actually goes into bigger turmoil than it has been before. And so my hope is that, I mean, at some point the military would understand that if they stay long, this is going to be the case. The risk for African leaders, and I think the African Union in particular and the regional economic bodies, is to think about the fact that if these transitions don't take place now, we are going to get to a point where there'll be widespread protests against the military and they will crack down and it is just going to make this region a lot more unstable. So the, earlier the African Union and other democracy advocates really came in and try, helped to think through the transition process and guide the process. I think we need African leadership in, that, in this particular case. The external, you know, whether it's the West or any other external actor can help, but I think the African Union and African leaders have to be at the, same, at the front of this and lead the transition process and get the help from others. Yeah, I totally agree. And when you look at um, the kind of earlier waves of interim military governments, like I was suggesting Burkina Faso in, in 2014, or even like the Mali 2012 uh, coup, I think there was, to Nana Hall's earlier point, you know, the, er the, the sense of um, norms that these would not be militaries that stay in power, that they would be transitional militaries was much stronger and then the set of pressures that, that they were receiving from other actors were, were much stronger and so now, like Joseph is saying, I'm, I'm concerned that there's a, a, a much more um, a vision to kind of stay longer, although the results, since 2020, the military-led governments have experienced 
for the most part, further deterioration of both the security situation and the economic well-being uh, and citizen rights. So on all three fronts of social, economic, and security, uh, you know, the military governments have not performed well. And then when you're looking at one of the interesting things, you know, kind of coming back to our measurement questions or what we can observe empirically, if you have a kind of straight line, whether it's Freedom House, you know, scores staying the same or VDEM scores staying the same, it doesn't actually tell us much about whether it's a kind of low-level uh, competitive authoritarian regime like Gabon, uh, for example, just very stable but not democratic, or whether you have a kind of military cycling, transitional, you know, to, to electoral authoritarianism and then another coup or, or, or that kind of, that could look like the same measurement um, in VDEM. So I think it's a really important question that you ask of what are we observing um, when we're at this level of low democratic functioning? My understanding, and I haven't checked these particular juntas, is that juntas always come in with a very similar legitimation strategy but what changes soon thereafter in the first few weeks and months is, is what story they start to tell later on. So they'll usually say, this was an emergency. The current situation was not democratic. We're acting in defense of democratic norms. We're acting to, to create security. But then the question of, even if they say they're temporary, that will be amended and reformed as time goes on we're putting together the junta, we've examined the question, we, we think we will need to stay, this phase will need to be a little bit longer, they'll push deadlines back, they won't, they'll stop mentioning numbers. And so it's less what they say initially and more what they say later on. Um, one thing I wanna add here is that once a junta takes power, they're under pressure sometimes from the outside sometimes from the grassroots, from citizens who become dissatisfied, but they're also pr under pressure from other military actors. So if you talk about Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. right, and you have the overthrow of, of Kabore by Damiba, who is saying, look, the situation here uh, in terms of security is horrible, that's in January. But by September, he himself is overthrown. And one of the things to remember is that military juntas are highly unstable. They can sometimes create a stable situation. To take a step out of, of Africa for a second, you know, if you're a Strassner in Paraguay, you can stay in power for a very long time. But that's a rare thing. And even in situations where in hindsight something looks stable, the initial phase may not be so stable. So we think of Chile's government as being a stable military rule, but Pinochet has a settling with the other members of the junta very early on, um, and he assumes power, he elbows others aside. And, and these are dangerous and unstable periods of time. African military juntas tend to be less stable, and so this is one of the reasons why their governance performance is lousy. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I uh, agree with a lot of things that have been said here. I'm from Burkina Faso. Um, and um, in terms of like um, the situation in Burkina Faso, the military came to solve uh, the security situation. But uh, when uh, they started, I think the situation actually worsened. Uh, it hasn't been solved. And uh, now uh, the problem is the desire of the military to actually stay in power uh, ad vitam eternum, like for forever. Uh, because of uh, the Russian influence, they brought in uh, some Wagner group, now they call uh, Africa Corps. I think in Burkina, like more than 500 uh, you know, Wagner soldiers are already in the capital city, uh, you know, paid by the military junta to protect the, the, the power. So they're kind of making it difficult for uh, anything uh, to happen in terms of another coup. Like you mentioned, we had a coup within the coup, like another military taking over another military. And I suspect something like that might, might, might come again. Uh, if, because now it's hard for the population to go in the street. 
because they made it difficult for them to actually protest. Mm -hmm. But then within the military junta, another leader can actually take uh, you know, over uh, you know, through another military coup. It can happen in Burkina, it can happen also uh, in Mali. So the situation is really complex. Now, uh, I think my question is uh, regarding the US and the Western um, you know, uh, uh, you know, influence as well. So what are, according to you, like some ways the US or the Western powers can engage with the actual military agendas? Are there ways they can, they can engage with them uh, to try to find to find solution at this point in time? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Maybe I'll let my colleagues respond about the US and other actors. But on the continent, I think the African Union should play a role. Mm -hmm. The challenge with the African Union is this, that they operate on a principle called subsidiarity. And that principle means that Anything that is happening in any region of the continent, the regional bloc should be responsible and not the African Union. But that is a completely wrong way to think about the African Union because it's not, it's not a hierarchical institution. This is an institution that operates as a collective, a collaboration, as opposed to the African Union is here is higher than the, say, ECOWAS. African Union is not higher than ECOWAS. It's just a parallel set of countries that are operating together. But when they invoke the principle of subsidiarity, what they then do is that they leave Burkina Faso to ECOWAS, and then the AU removes itself from it, which doesn't help, because you need that kind of momentum to go in. And I think the African Union should step in to end that, that particular situation you've talked about. If the African Union were to step in, work with the military junta, and say, we don't want Wagner Group in this country, because this is our territory and we don't want you, mm -hmm. they can do that. If you leave it to ECOWAS, sometimes even the countries within the region themselves don't agree. And if you leave it to the regional uh, blocks, then it creates even more problems for us. So I just hope that at some point the African Union will do away with this you know, self-defeating principle of subsidiarity and go in as a collaboration as instead. And I think the African Union should be the first point of call in terms of their engagement with, um, especially the situation in Burkina Faso. Okay, so I, I totally agree. That's an excellent point that Joseph has made. And let me just add, when we're thinking about um, the principle of multipolarity, one of the things I think the U.S. or you know Western Europe should not do, because that's easier to diagnose, perhaps, is to insist that our allies and partners choose only us, right? To say you can't do business with China is mm -hmm. not going to work, right? You cannot uh, do business with Russia, um, you know, is not going to work. And we've lower, we've risked our relationship with key partners like South Africa um, with this kind of um, unipolar diplomacy. Um, and so I think recognizing the um, heterogeneity on the continent while partnering more um, carefully around domestic needs rather than a globalized uh, lens is a better way to build effective partnerships and then not have the kind of backlash that we see as so counterproductive, um, which the U.S. is experiencing right now in the Sahel. My understanding is that the U.S. continues to engage with countries that have engaged in, that, that have governments that came in by coup for, for a variety of reasons. One of them is that humanitarian needs persist and developmental needs persist. You don't want to punish the average person who, you know, may be relying on medicine which is presided, provided by the U.S. So all of those relationships continue. There are certain high level engagement that, that gets cut off and certain things in the middle. but. The aid which is going directly to people, and we had someone from USAID here, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that, that does continue as, as long as, as we can. Now that said, having talked to people who are part of decision-making processes, I'm being vague for a reason, my understanding is that there is an effort to try to reach out to some of these leaders and offer them a graduated series of steps. 
which might allow them to come closer and closer again. And what you say is, look, if you want to distance yourself, then we will be, it'll be harder for us to provide help. But if you move from being a military government to a civilian transitionary government within a certain period of time, then we can increase our aid. If you have elections, we can increase our engagements again. And so that sort of process does exist. But one of the challenges here is that it requires attention and knowledge. And if you look at the State Department, the State Department's Africa Bureau is hugely understaffed. We have a large number of State Department people who are devoted to the country of Luxembourg. If you go to the State Department, you will find that, you know, there is a one person who's in charge of West Africa and he's got a number of different desk officers underneath him. But it's, it's really quite small compared to the ridiculous number of people we have devoted to Europe. And similarly, we have a large number of people in the field in Europe. And it's weird because, in fact, European countries tend to work directly with, with Washington. So in some ways, you need people in Brussels less. There is a, a close connection between Brussels and DC. You don't need a ton of American diplomats on the ground over there. But where do you need them? You, you actually need them in these countries. And then you also need to have enough attention behind this. And unfortunately, because Africa is considered an unknown and the US government doesn't have a ton of expertise and doesn't have a ton of contacts on a routine basis, then they have to, they have to use sort of deliberate attention to a question. And that deliberate attention is an extremely short supply. And, and that's one of, one of the structural problems which is baked into the relationship between the US and the African continent. It's not just Africa. It's true for a good deal of the global south. But Africa has particular challenges. Unlike Latin America, it's further away. Um, and the stories that we tell ourselves about Africa and how Africa couldn't possibly be important be important, I think make all of this a good deal worse. And so you have both proximate challenges and you have some very deep long-term structural issues that have to be addressed when it comes to Africa. And, and these are things that, that make me discouraged because they're going to require a good deal of consistent attention to fix. But, but think about this. Imagine walking up to any random American on the street and mentioning something about Africa. What is it they think of Africa? What do they know of Africa? What associations and biases do they bring? I mean, I, I knew someone who was a, a student in Guinea and she had trouble getting her mail because the postal service in Chicago was rerouting mail to give from that was addressed to Guinea, to Guinea-Bissau, New Guinea, Guyana, um, all sorts of places in the world. And, and these are postal officers. And, and so if we have that basic problem with connection, then think about how, how hard it is to build all of the layers one on top of the other. Other questions? Yes. So I'm interested in this question because I find a remarkable gap in the literature. The military is a black box for political scientists, many political scientists. My basic questions are, who goes into the officer corps? What are their motivations? What do they learn in military academy? Do they learn that the army is a beacon of modernization, that civilians are incompetent, that they're technologically better? Do they learn that they're the moral reservoir of the nation? I mean, what goes on with sort of who joins and what is their socialization? Does anyone know? Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I, I do have one of a colleague called um, Kamisa Kamara. She mm -hmm. used to be um, a minister in Mali, and now she, she is writing her dissertation just on that. 
<laughs> Why do the military think that they can do better in governance? What is it that psychologically? They say they do worse. Yes. They end up they do worse because, I mean, I think sometimes they deceive themselves, delude themselves into thinking that they can do better because they are well trained, they are disciplined, and they can do things better. But governing is a completely different thing. But I think her dissertation would be a good answer to your, your question. There. <laughs> she, she is actually going into the psychology of the military hunters mm -hmm. and people who have seized power to try to understand what it is, what was their calculations to do that. I don't have the answer now, but I hope that I'll have it soon. Here's, here's the weird thing. Unlike Latin America, where you have a history of a substantial gap between civilians and military, where you have military families which are long-standing and, and a good deal of social distance. If, if I'm going to generalize broadly in a slightly unprofessional way, you don't have that in African countries. For one thing, you have the connections between military people and society are, are extensive. I never met a military officer who had that kind of social distance that I read about in the Latin Americanist literature. Um, and instead, these are, are officers who are highly embedded in different ways, within a regional framework, within an ethnic framework, with ties to business, with family members who are in, in a large number of different positions. And so it is perplexing precisely because of this lack of social distance that in fact you see this language coming out of Hunters. And not only that, but I have in my interactions with, with African military officers, I have heard them make broad generalizations about military officers versus the civilian world. And it's weird because I don't actually feel as if they are that different. I can qualify that in a bunch of different ways. It depends on whether the military is highly ethnicized and drawn from a small group. But even then, that same small group will dominate the civilian government as well. So it doesn't actually help to explain the problem that you're talking about. So I, I don't have a good answer, but I will tell you that the answer is not the answer <coughs> that existed in the classic Latin American civil military relations literature, which is about this long-standing gap between you know, the Peruvian military and the Peruvian citizens and, and how that creates this sense of, of separation and moral superiority. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist. One of the um, small empirical findings that I've seen um, is that where uh, militaries have a lot of externally engaged peacekeeping operations, they are less likely to be engaged in coups because they're paid well and they're professionalized by these external missions. But I'm worried that those findings corresponded and overlapped with this period of lack of coup activity, right? Kind of 1990s through early 2000s where we weren't seeing that many coups anyway. So I don't know, um, but my sense is that that still holds because um, in, the in the countries that we're talking about, the militaries are really, they're not being sent elsewhere. They're so engaged on the domestic security questions that they're not likely to be on these external peacekeeping. But places like Uganda uh, are well known for kind of sending militaries to other countries for peacekeeping missions, keeping them out of the possibility of a, a coup on a long-standing you know, authoritarian leader, Museveni. Jamie, did you have a thought on that too? Yeah, I just wanted to, at least for the, the subset of Sahelian countries, I'd say like two of the major policy issues on the table, right, are managing security and then also sovereignty, right? And so the army is the symbol of the state and willingness to stand up for that state. I mean, I think they see themselves well positioned on those two valence issues. Did Scott had a maybe two finger? I have a question, thank you. Very interesting panel. Um, my question I don't, I, is about regional, cross-regional heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Um, in Latin America, democracies used to mostly die by military coups and occasionally by executive takeovers. Uh, 
since the third wave of democratization began in 1978, there's been one death of democracy by military coup, which was Honduras in 2009. And all of the other cases, I think it's seven, maybe six if you use VDEM data, are executive takeovers. So I'm just wondering, I mean, what, what would your reflections be about why there's so much regional difference? Yeah. And there's a two finger from Laura down here. Latin America. I don't know if those happen in Africa as well. Great. Let's yeah. take so I can start just by saying that, you know, the, the same pattern of, you know, the, the decline of coups and the, you know, authoritarianism, democratic backsliding, the end of democracy was happening via executive grant aggrandizement in Africa up until 2020 you know, 2019. So that was very parallel, I would say, for the most part, like tw Mali 2012 was a, a, an exception, but for the most part, this was the exact same kind of data that we could see cross-regionally using VDEM and, you know, that there was an era of democratic death via coup and we were past that and we are into democratic death via nominally democratic institutions and, and using um, executive aggrandizement um, in particular to, to do that. So I would say that that is still a broad pattern on the continent, but this um, type of the, the move to coups is, is very recent, very uh, concerning, and in part, you know, it may have to do with the fact that there was so little transitional justice, very little um, uh, of those processes that took place um, on the continent. Um, but I also think that it, it does have to do with um, so the parallels with Latin America around security and the lack of security are very significant, but maybe the ways in which um, the actors who think they can provide security are different, differently expressed. So, you know, instead of the Bukele, um, we have the coup. And they're the same response, in a sense, trying to, uh, to provide that security, but uh, a different channel of uh, the, the question of disorder? I think part of the answer has to do with the regional association. So, so first, I, I want to agree with what Rachel said, which is if we were having this conversation five years ago, we would actually be remarking on, on the surprising convergence mm -hmm. between the regions despite all sorts of other things. <laughs> there is one big difference, which is the organization of, of American states is a lot more aggressive at consistently penalizing countries that engage in coups. And the African Union, particularly in its previous or uh, in instantiation, um, was, was not. And you also see a good deal more tolerance for this sort of gradual erosion of, of democracy. I think that's part of it. Um, I think some of it is simply that some of the countries in Latin America were able to buy themselves breathing room. So one of the things about the coup trap is if you've had a past coup, you're more likely to have a future coup. There are reasons for that that I can explain. But as an empirical regularity, there's a timing out. Um, and one of the things you saw in Latin America was that some of the military governments, the hunters that came in in the 70s, we're able to stabilize things. And so it has been a while since there was a coup in Brazil. It has been a while since there was a coup in Argentina or Chile or Paraguay and so, or in El Salvador. All of these things mean that it is, that, that extra time I think has changed things. And I know that's, that's not wholly satisfying because then the question is, what is the mechanism? What about it? And we can, we can talk about what it is. Part of it is that when a coup starts, if there's been a previous coup, people 
are more likely to believe a coup can succeed. It creates a groove into which you can, you can go. Um, but I, I think there are other things as well. I think the Latin American militaries professionalized and they learned that there would be a penalty, a penalty if they were to engage in coup making again. Um, I think the Brazilians know that if they were to behave in a way which were, if they were to make a coup, they would lose a good deal of world respect. And, and that's not how they see themselves now. It's not how the Argentine military sees itself now. They, they've mentally separated themselves from that time. But I, I do think that is part of the story. Um, so part of it is a random coincidence in terms of, I think we have a blip of coups here, but I think part of it is that West Africa was still a more fertile ground for coups to occur. And I think, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, would agree with the, the regional institutions because I, if the African Union were that strong and able to, it's an, uh, Asset itself, even West Africa, where it is fragile, could have worked against you know the proliferation of coups. And as he said, I think if we had this conversation five years ago, we've been talking about convergence, but now it does seem like there's this divergence. And I do believe that the regional institutions do play a big role. I just wish that the African Union would position itself in a way that it can have more say in what countries do, as opposed to trying to leave it to regions because. If you leave it to the East Africa regional community, the countries, as I said earlier, they don't necessarily agree on certain things, but you do need that collective action where the militaries know that there will be a penalty if you do this. And the African Union have provisions, really well-written provisions against military coups or what they call unconstitutional change of government, which is well-written and documented. The follow-through is not there because of that principle of subsidiarity. Yeah. I do think there's a reason why Nigeria and Ghana are very unlikely to have coups again. Yeah. Those are militaries yeah. that would would lose a lot mm -hmm. if if they were to yeah. to engage in this sort yeah. of behavior. Mm -hmm. Great. So maybe one final question, uh, Cecilia. <laughs> Really easy to answer. So I, I'm not convinced that China is agnostic to regime type. I think we observe in Southeast Asia that China has a preference for authoritarian regimes because it's just one person or group of people to negotiate with slash pay off. And because those kinds of regimes are more resilient to a popular dissatisfaction resulting from uh, incursions on sovereignty. So how does that play out in Africa? Really easy. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'll just take a very small piece of that <laughs> question, but um, so I, I think you're exactly right, and I also think that China is not ambivalent in part because of the huge investments that they've made in the critical mineral resource chain, right, that is fueling all of the uh, kind of green economy that is necessary, cobalt, lithium, on and on and on, right? So, so China to my sense, uh, it, you know, is able to negotiate and it's able to n maybe not punish the coup makers so long as they have the sense that they're gonna keep their contracts, right? So there is a real, to my mind, economic driving um, logic that, that uh, allows the, the kind of acceptance, um, both on the political and the um, security level. I don't know whether they care so much about the regime type as much as they do about the security and the particular agreements which are made. So it, consider Cambodia. Um, sorry, um, con consider uh, Myanmar. In Myanmar, they had a good agreement with Aung San Suu Kyi's government. And when the, hunt, when the military came in, this was a disruption to the agreement that they created. But they very quickly said, okay, now get in line and we will, we will make an agreement with, with the new incumbent. And I think that's what matters more to them. I don't think they like democracy. Um, but I also don't think that they think that all authoritarian governments are the same. And so what they want is they have a, a very particular commercial transactionalism. Now, this, one of the interesting things is it wasn't clear 
to African militaries if this would be the case at first. So the story goes, allegedly, before Mugabe was overthrown, that the people in ZANU-PF and on the military side who were going to overthrow Mugabe, they went to the Chinese first. And they said, look, it is likely something like this will happen. How might you respond if this occurred? And the Chinese said, as long as our agreements stay in place, the rest of this is up to you. Now, all of this is allegedly, right? I, I have no source other than stuff I've, I've read. Um, but it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so this is, this is where I think the Chinese matter. But that said, the Chinese matter in terms of creating both a normative space where they don't want to penalize governments for not being democratic and for providing economic relationships which are going to be consistent no matter who is in power and that really weakens the pro-democratic norm that, that the West is offering. So I think that has a, a significant impact in the same way that the Russians as a provider of security is, is creating a, a weakness. I, I actually think that in two years, uh, the Africa Corps, formerly known as the Wagner Group, will probably largely be gone. They're very fickle, they are very short-term oriented, and I also am not at all convinced Putin is going to let them persist, um, particularly given what he did to their leader. Um, but I do think that um, Russia is interested in playing this this role of, of breaking up some of these Western normative mm -hmm. agreements. Mm -hmm. Which comes back to Scott's question as well, really, about you know, some of the variation in Latin America and Africa. No, I, I, just the last point on this, I think yeah, China does play a role, but it's like their biggest role is the economics. So they, they are interested in economic issues, not political. And of course, I know people have been concerned about with the influence of China, will that undermine the support for democracy on the continent? And the answer is no. There's zero inf no correlation between what China does and people's commitment to democracy. It's just not there. Africans do see both the US and China's investments, especially in the economic front, as a win-win situation. When you ask Africans about the influence of China and the influence of um, the US, when they are both positive, they go up together and they mm -hmm. come down together. And so there's actually no gap in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it's what, when it comes to the issue of democracy, it doesn't really affect people's no commitment to democratic governance. Mm -hmm. You see there's still a, an itch. Okay, <laughs> Clark, if you have one last short question, <laughs> we'll sneak it in. Is this clustering because they're former French colonies? Because they're, why are the security dilemmas up in the north different than the south? Are the militaries different? Are, is the French remaining and training militaries, encouraging the militaries to search for? It's, I mean, it's clearly clustered, right? Except for a little aberration down there in uh, Kinshasa recently. But, we don't see them in the South, so why is that? Circumstantial. Well, that's not an academic answer. <laughs> I mean... That's not what Einstein would say. We, need, say we need science here, so it can't... It really is just circumstantial? That's my the, argument. The complex crisis created with the fall of... After the fall of Libya. Yeah. Um, is it Libya? Yeah. These yeah. states being on the front lines. Um, complex relationships with France. Uh, specific, really, like, former... Uh, colonies and their relationship with France, I think, is pretty distinct. Um, what else would people add to this list? Feel free. No, I definitely think the kind of plurif proliferation of arms and non-state kind of extremist actors with the fall of Libya, and the continuing the like the France Afrique interventionist has has led to this sense of real, you know lack of accountability, impunity, and that transfers across the military in very significant ways. So there is a, a Francophone legacy ongoing story, um, which we see you know, in terms of the protests against France. And then this willingness of things like the Wagner Group to fill in that vacuum. Great, well thank you all. Please join me in applauding our panelists. <laughs>